good morning, good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to another exciting broadcast with us here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Now, last year we did over 400 of these. This is just our fifth of 2024. So a big welcome back for all our student audience joining from across North America and beyond as we get to celebrate the coolest scientists, explorers, and amazing places on planet Earth. Now today, for our zoo audience specifically, we are back in as the digital education partner of your Toronto Zoo. Uh, I'm so excited to be back with them featuring another amazing story. We've got monthly programs set up with them for the rest of the school year. So stay tuned for those on the YouTube channel, Facebook channel and more. Uh, back in November, December, we did some really special ones. Those are on our YouTube channel, so do check them out there. They're also on the Toronto Zoo YouTube channel for our audience there as well. Now, without further ado, I want to bring in Mary Ellen Fraser. She is my favorite educator in the world. You're in for such a treat today. And today we're going to learn about biofacts. When I used to go to the zoo as a boy, I always loved seeing all the animals that, of course, my favorite thing, but they have so many fossils and bones and furs and teeth and things that help you understand animals in a more deep and meaningful way. And today we're going to explore a few of those together. So some really cool stuff Mary Ellen's got in the go. I'm really excited for all your questions on anything about animals you ever wanted to know at the end of this broadcast. But without further ado, I'm going to turn you over to Mary Ellen to blow your minds. Welcome in everybody and thank you so much Mary Ellen for joining us again. Hello. <laughs> hello, hello. Thank you and happy new year, everyone. I am so excited to be back. I absolutely love doing these videos here with Jesse. As he mentioned, we've done a lot in the past couple of years. We have a whole roster coming up for the rest of the school year and even into the next school year as well. And we're just so excited to be doing these. And I just absolutely love being able to share the zoo with everyone who tunes in. Before we get started though, I'm gonna have Jesse bring up our land acknowledgement here for us, and then we'll jump into today's program. So first off, we would just like to acknowledge that the land that we are standing on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, with the Mississauga of the Credit and the Williams Treaty, signed with multiple Mississauga and Chippewa bands. Thank you so much, Jesse. So we're gonna get into today to, to today's program. Sorry about that there. And it's a bit of an interesting one. So usually what we do with our videos is I'm out on site looking at live animals that we have and educating about them. But as you might know, if you've watched some of our videos and Jesse can definitely attest to this, is sometimes the live animals they do what they want to do and we don't always have the best shot of them or the best view. Sometimes they turn away from us just as we're talking about them and they want to go have a nap, they want to go eat, or maybe they just don't want to be with us anymore. And that's totally okay. But it can make educating a little bit more challenging. But we have something here in the learning and engagement section of our zoo or our department called biofacts. Now, I've actually done a video on a few of these in the past as well, and we guess what different ones are, but we're going to go a little bit more in depth to them today and see the actual scope of how we use them, how they can help us learn about animals, educate about them. And then we also do have a special live animal treat at the end for our Q&A segment. Now, anybody watching right now, I urge you to stay close to your keyboard. I like to ask a lot of questions. It's one of our favorite things here. So everyone stay ready to type in your answers on any of the chats on Facebook, on YouTube, um, or our live classes as well to text into Jesse and let him know your answer. We love the interaction and getting to work together. Now, I've got a few tables set up behind me here. We can kind of see one. I'm going to try and hide it with my body here so it's not given away too early yet. Um, but what is a biofact? So it's a biological artifact. So something that we're able to take from an animal after they've passed away or something we can take for them while they're living and it doesn't bother them. They don't need it anymore. And then we can use it for educational purposes. Now, what I will be showing today, some of it is... Uh, real, which means it came from a real animal, but some of it is also replicas. And we're going to talk about why those are important and really useful as well. Now, everything that I have here with me, if it came from a real animal, that animal was not harmed in getting this item. We did not kill the animal or put them down to get this item. 
the item was collected after the animal had already passed away. And we can talk a little bit about what that means and why we take these items for the educational region reasons. And most of what I'm showing here today as well, you're not allowed to own as an individual person. But here at the Toronto Zoo, we're allowed to have them for educational reasons. So we're gonna kind of get a little bit more into them here. Now, sometimes can be a little bit harder uh, to use them. So I'm gonna hold up just kind of an example here. This is actually part of a giraffe that we have here. And you're gonna see that some of our biofacts are actually in better or in worse condition than some of our other ones. So this is part of their mane. So you can see the mane right up here, but we can also see there's some bald patches on them. And that's why we just have to be really gentle and really careful with our biofacts. So I encourage you, if you ever come to the zoo or any other facility like ours and they have these out and about, by all means, go up and learn from them. They're a great educational tool, but I urge everyone to be very careful when using them because they are very precious and they are very delicate as well. All right, so first we'll kind of ask a question to the group here. Has anyone seen any biofacts at a zoo before? We'll get some yeses and nos going in the group chat. Well, Jesse's got his hand up here, <laughs> seen a couple. What do we think? If anyone wants to yell out yes too, I can put I can bring in the class for a quick sec. West you, Ms. Ross, Mr. Shedberg. Yes? Maybe? No? Some people a little bit? Okay. Some of you are right in the heart of big cities with zoos and aquaria. And if that's the case, hopefully you have. Some of you are a little bit further afield. So a little bit of yes, a little bit of no. Our chat is a lot of yeses, which is great. That's awesome. So you might have actually seen, if you've come to the Toronto Zoo, you might have seen some of the ones that I'm going to show today as they're often out with our amazing volunteer team that we have here at the zoo. Um, and they put them out on big tables when we're really busy and people can come up and see them all together. Now I'm going to hold up a skull here and we're going to play a little bit of a guessing game. We're going to see what our base knowledge is and see if we know what animal this skull maybe came from. All right, here's our first one for us. And I'm gonna cover where it actually says its name. But this is our first skull. Now I'll point some things out for you. It's got forward facing eyes. So the eyes would go here and here looking directly at us. And it's got some nice, really sharp teeth. What animal do we think this is from? All right, we've got some things coming in in the chat. We've got Wolf is our first guest. Okay. We've got, by the way, we've got folks in Arizona, Indiana, Oregon, all over Ontario first. We've got another Wolf as an answer. Fox, okay, so we're in the, the canine family related to dogs. Very good. Anyone else? Bear. So we've got big toothy predatory things. Uh, there we go. That's a pretty good guess, I think. That's pretty good. And actually, our first two were right on. It is a wolf skull. So we've got a wolf here. And the way that we can tell, as I kind of mentioned, it's got the front facing eyes. A good rule of thumb for looking at a skull or looking at an animal to know if it's a predator versus a prey is eyes on the front of their face means they're a predator. Eyes on the side means they're a prey. So think of a horse compared to a wolf. Eyes on front versus a horse has their eyes looking out to the side and they're more of a prey animal. And then we also talked about their big, sharp teeth. So this animal has sharp teeth all the way to the back, which, maybe I'll let the audience guess here, what do we think that means they're eating then if they've got the sharp teeth all the way through their mouth? Mm, what do wolves eat? Are wolves eating berries and, and mm -hmm. plants? No, we got meat. Yes, I think exactly, that's yeah. so they're, <laughs> those, they're a carnivore species. So when we see sharp teeth all the way through, it's a pretty good indication that they are a carnivore. Now, what I'm going to do here is I also have the full fur out for us as well. So I'm going to just remove my camera here and let me just switch my camera around so that we are looking at our table. Give me one quick second here. There we go. But this is actually a full wolf pelt as well. So really cool thing about our collection here at the zoo is that we are able to uh, showcase all different parts of the animal. So not just their skulls, but then also something like this where we can actually see their full fur. Now, again, this animal was not hurt for this. The animal has already passed away and we were then given the opportunity 
to save their fur and use it for educational purposes. And what we can teach with this now is while we're looking at it, you can see it's very, very thick fur. There's a lot of it here. And that tells us that this animal is well insulated. They have a big fluffy tail, just like a scarf that we would use in the winter time. I'm gonna have to go outside in a little bit when we do our question and answer period. And you're gonna see me have to get all bundled up in order to go out there. And that's basically what this wolf has, is they have a full bundle of fur around them. And something else that's kind of cool is we can also compare and contrast. So this one here, it's very similar to a wolf, but it's just a little bit smaller. And obviously this isn't their full pelt. Some of them are just pieces, but this is actually a coyote skull. So coyote is another animal that we see very often here. And in fact, we have several of them that are what I call non-inventory coyotes uh, as they don't belong to the Toronto Zoo, uh, but they are just wild in this area and they do come on property. We can kind of see a comparison between the wolf and coyote, which is really cool and see how related they are and how they have a lot of similar properties between them as well. All right, I'm gonna turn my camera back around here for me. Give me one quick second and we'll go with our next biofact. All right, I'm gonna add you back onto our little stand here. I apologize in advance, today's videos might be a little bit more bumpy for all of our friends. Um, so I'm gonna try and make it as smooth as possible for us today. Turbulence. I feel like yeah, I want, we're going yeah. on a ride today. Oh, there we go. I got to get you back in the stand for us. All right. Now, I've used one of these in the past before. Um, and last time we did a video together in December, Jesse, we talked about the animal enrichment giving tree, which I will say the animals got lots of amazing Christmas presents this year. And if you follow us on social media, you're gonna see those be rolled out as we're able to purchase them from all of our donations that we got over the winter break. Uh, so be, or check us out on Instagram and Facebook, all those places that we are posting on to see what new toys our animals got this year. And something that some of our animals really love is a big jolly ball like this. This one was well loved, as you can see all these fun marks on it. And unfortunately, once they do break open like this, we do have to call it quits and replace it. This becomes dangerous for the animal and it can even be dangerous for us. We do sometimes have to file the edges so that we can have it afterwards to make sure that um, it's safe for us to handle as well. But what do we think had this animal first? or had this ball first what animal do we think had it mm, anyone want to chime in youtube chat facebook on on a new facebook page you guys have been awesome in the chat uh anything you want to guess stream yard classes please do chime in all right our first guess is our polar bear bear lion so some big toothy carnivore again uh i have no idea by the way going into this just so you know as an audience <laughs> like i was not prompted in this I'm nope. gonna, you know what? I'm going to say it's a herbivore. I'm going to miss things up. We got wolf coming in. I'm going to say it's like a rhino, an angry Ooh. rhino, just stomping on it and crushing it that way. Uh, those are our guests. Wolf, bear, lion. What do we think? Bear well, I love the rhino answer. We do have some barrels that our rhinos have stomped on before. So you're right. They can be very destructive. But this one in particular was from one of our uh, tigers which is really cool. So you can see here, there's some scrapes on it. Those are from their claws. And then the punctures in it can be from their claws or from their teeth. Now, I don't have a tiger tooth out today, but what I do have is a lion tooth and they are quite similar. Oh, sorry, the ball is gonna fall off a table here. We gotta get it secure. That's the thing though, is it does still sort of roll around. So we have a lion canine tooth here, which is pretty impressive. So if you want to see a comparison of how big this actually is, if you hold up your thumb like this, I'd say if you're below the age of 12, it's gonna be from maybe the bottom of your hand to the top of your thumb. But if you're above the age of 12, it's gonna be from like the meaty part of your thumb up to the top of your thumb. So you can take a look on your own body but that's how big their canine teeth are. So the kind of sharp ones that you have in the front, and that's what's making those punctures in that ball and also their prey that they would be hunting as well, which is very impressive. You would not want to go head to head with them. Um, they are a very large and in charge animal. 
Now, instead, like I mentioned, I don't have a tiger fur with me, but what I do have, I'm gonna switch our camera back around here for us, is I do have a lion fur for us to take a look at here. So again, I tried to get as much as I could for the full animal. So we do have a full lion skull. Now, interestingly, this skull does open up, which is really cool. Some of our skulls open, some of them do not. It just depends on the type of skull. And also, this is one of our replicas. So I can tell that it's a replica for two reasons. Does anyone want to guess? I'll put a real skull next to it as an example. So this is our coyote skull. This one's real. This one's a replica. How do we think I can tell the difference? All right, let's chime in folks here. I'll put in my put myself off camera so you can see the animals a little bigger. Uh, color is our first one that's obvious. One's yeah. yellow and one's white. Yeah, <laughs> color galore. Uh, anyone else other than color? Shininess? Ooh, okay. okay. Yeah, so maybe that's it. They're too polished compared <laughs> to a real bone, which is a little more rough around the edges, literally and figuratively. Uh, <laughs> yep. Those are our answers. Color and shininess. There we go. So yeah, color is definitely the main one. So you can see that this one's kind of yellowy in color. Uh, the shiny could be, but I think from what that's from on this one is just from people touching it. And because of the material it's made of, it is a little bit shinier. The second one is a little bit hard to tell with these two, but it's actually looking at the teeth. So sometimes the color is right on a match. Like they're, they're both white and they're really hard to tell the difference. But a replica, the teeth are going to be much more secure in the skull itself versus a real one. The teeth are a little bit wiggly. And what we've had to do with this one is actually glue the teeth in so that they stay secure. So the teeth will eventually kind of get wiggly, just like our teeth do. You know, if we are getting new teeth in when we're younger, uh, they'll get a little wiggly and they'll start to fall out. But so what we have here is we have a replica lion skull. So again, you can see the size of those canine teeth. So there's my thumb. And then the tooth goes a little ways up into here as well. So to give you an idea of how big that tooth is there, absolutely massive. And that's what punctures through that ball. We can also see that they have their eyes facing forward at us. So we know that they are a uh, predator species. And if we look into their nose, you can see the intricacies of their nose here as well. That's what gives them the ability to have such a good sense of smell. Now, we're really lucky here as well. This fur that we have actually uh, was from a lion who used to live here at the Toronto Zoo. And that's typically how we get most of our furs. And this one is in really, really good shape. So we're really lucky to have it. And we do keep it in that shape by being careful when we pet it and we touch it to learn about it. And we have to be really careful the way that we put our paws and our tail on the table as well. So we make sure that nothing is hanging down over the edge and everything is kind of kept up nicely and folded here. And we only pet in the direction that the fur is going. So from head to tail. Now, sometimes we do have furs that don't have an animal name on them. So they've come from somewhere else. But often what that is, is somebody has found one, maybe in their aunt or uncle, grandparents, attic usually, or somewhere in their house, and they're not sure what to do with it. So they actually donate it to us at the zoo, and we're able to use it for education purposes. Now, a question we get all the time, I'm going to turn my camera back around here and put you guys back up on our stand. There we go, is how do I know kind of which one is which and how do I know which fur is which animal and where we got it from. Now kind of a cool thing that not everyone gets to see, everyone sees the biofacts themselves, but what I really like to show off is all the different jobs that you can have working at a place like the Toronto Zoo. And one of those jobs, believe it or not, is actually somebody who curates and collects and takes care of our biofact collection and our interpreter volunteer stations. And what we do here at the zoo is we have these really fancy branded bags and we have our animals listed on all of them here. So I have a big pile of them over here and we can actually see for our white lion one, it's a much bigger bag because it's a much bigger fur. So we got a big one here and on our white lion tag, we can actually see who the lion was and what their name was. Now this lion passed away before my time here at the zoo. So I don't know her as well, 
Um, but we do know that she lived here at the zoo, which is kind of just a cool thing to think about. And even though she's not with us anymore, she's still helping us to educate about these amazing animals and teaching all everyone who comes and visits the zoo about them, which is a really cool thing to think about that they have that purpose as well after they've passed away, which is awesome. All right, I've got a few more set up here. So we're gonna go on another little mission here and we're gonna turn our camera around one more time and we'll look at a few more things on the table. All right, let me grab the camera here. So I've got another partial fur here, not a full one, but this one, what do we think this animal is from? This is, the, this is a piece of its fur, and this is something it likes to do in the wild. So, Mary Ellen, we've got a bunch of Canadians, we've got a bunch of Americans joining us live on stream here. So I'm going to ask the Americans, because I think the Canadians <laughs> are all nailing this one. Just hold on. Yeah. Oh, the Californians come through. Way to go, everybody. There we go. That's perfect. Yes, exactly. So this is a beaver skull that we have here. And their skull is so interesting. I don't want to say it's too weird, but it's an incredible skull to see their teeth and the action that they can do there and, and how big their teeth are and then that big space that they have. And that they're able to do something like this and chew through so much wood and be able to knock down trees and build their dams out of it. It's just an incredible skill that these animals have. All right, next on our list here, I always think this one's kind of cool as well. What animal? This one might be a little bit hard, but this is a horn. Okay, so there's usually two of these on an animal's head. And I will say this is pretty heavy. Even me just holding it up here right now, my arm is starting to shake a little bit. What do we think, what animal do we think has this on their head? And this is what their fur looks like. Ooh, all right, we had Bayside Public School coming a little bit after, so welcome in Ms. Ivo's class. They say elephant. We've got our rescue school folks. I'm gonna ask you guys in Alberta, I'll bring you in live. What do we think? What do you think? Buffalo. 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 Okay. Very cool. We've got uh, Mr. Southern's class. You got to unmute your mic. I'll bring you in really quick, but this is a tricky one. We're going to get lots of different answers. What do we think? Cochran. A dog. A dog. A dog. Yeah. A dog. We've got gazelle. We've got antelope. We've got bull. We've got elephant. We've got all sorts of things. It's exciting. <laughs> all right. Whoever said antelope, you're on the closest track to it, I would guess. Uh, this is from a greater kudu. So a very, very cool animal. They are like a uh, savanna or African uh, gazelle or antelope type animal. They're in that same family. Uh, but this is from a kudu. Now, importantly, this is a horn, not an antler. So horns are, are uh, pieces that will grow with an animal their whole life. And an antler will fall off seasonally. All right. Now, a couple other things I wanted to show you here is you might notice I do have a full cheetah skull and pelt here as well as a cheetah claw that we can take a look at. I have my kudu, I have my beaver, I have a lion, and I have a wolf. And you might say, well Mary Ellen, that's a lot of mammals you got going on here. Really on the table, we only see one reptile, which is our snake that we have here. Now this is a few different things from a few different types of snakes. This is their full skin. We also have a snake shed. So this is collected uh, from diff multiple different snakes, and the, they shed naturally, so this doesn't hurt them. We're able to just collect it out, out of their exhibit uh, whenever they do shed for growing purposes or when they need to refresh their scales, so that's easy to collect from them, and we have a bunch of those. But really, this is the only one that I have for anything that's not a mammal, and that's because, unfortunately, most other animals are really hard to collect biofacts from. So when you think about all the properties of what wakes us mammals or makes a mammal a mammal, you think warm-blooded, uh, they have fur or hair on them, and those characteristics make it really easy for us to save biofacts from them and save parts of them. It's easier to treat them and preserve them. But animals like reptiles, amphibians, fish, they are much harder and that's because they get really brittle when they start to dry out. So these containers here, they're all taped shut. So unfortunately we can't open any of them and that's because touching them on a regular basis would actually cause them to break apart much faster. For example, I have here a little starfish. 
But again, we have to be super careful because you'll notice on the end, it's already starting to break off. So it's really hard to keep uh, biofacts for animals who are more uh, wet <laughs> than a mammal is on a typical basis. And so it makes it a little bit hard to have them in our collection. Another kind of interesting example for that is birds can sometimes be a little bit easier. So we have an ostrich eggshell here, which if I tap on it, I don't know if you guys could hear that, but it almost sounds like glass. It's a very kind of sharp sound, like if you tap on a window. And then this one as well here, this is actually a little penguin egg that we have saved. So these eggs are still, well, this one's not whole, but it's still in really good shape and it's very strong and sturdy. These are eggs from my personal favorite uh, snake, which is called a red-tailed green rat snake. And you can see that they used to actually be a full egg about this big. And now they're all shriveled up and kind of curled. And eventually over time, as they move around in this container, they are gonna kind of turn to dust and break apart even more. And so it's really difficult for us to keep these biofacts around and being able to use them for different animals out there. So it's a lot easier for us to contain and or sorry, to keep and use our biofacts that we have uh, that are from mammals or birds than it is for our reptiles and amphibians, unfortunately. All right, now I'm gonna take one more time here to change our camera and then I promise we'll stay on the same camera after that. But what I need to do right now is get ready to head outside for our live animal component here for us. And so I need to uh, actually get myself winterized just like our wolf fur is and they show us how well that they can prepare for the winter and if you missed it Jesse and I actually did I believe it was our November video we actually did a whole video together about how animals prepare for the winter time uh, and are able to uh, survive out in the cold and if you didn't know uh, in Toronto here today it's pretty cold I think it's about negative uh, 8 to 10 degrees Celsius out there's a wind chill, so it feels a little bit colder than that. But we do have quite a bit of snow, and I believe Jesse's in the middle of a snowstorm as well out on the East Coast. We need sweaters here. There's like an epic 100 kilometer an hour hurricane winds coming in sideways with like three foot drifts in front of my house right now. It's very exciting for our southern United States friends who are basking in like 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 20 Celsius. It's very lucky you. <laughs> I'm a little jealous of that right now. I will say as I've had to get uh, a little bundled up as we head outside. So we're gonna look at some real animals now and we're gonna talk a little bit about them as well. Um, and then we're gonna be able to ask some questions today. So feel free to ask me any questions about our biofacts that we saw, but also any of the animals here at the zoo as well. There'll be lots of time for Q&A and we're gonna go with a little point of view here. Uh, so right now I'm standing in our learning and engagement center. Uh, this is actually a building where we house all of our school programs, our zoo camp in the summertime. They all have their home bases out of here. And we're actually going to go together now and walk through our lobby and outside to meet our special animal visitor. So come on with me. I'll try and keep as still as I can here. And we're in our lobby now. And then we're going to go outside and brave the cold together. So we're going to head on out. Here we go. It stopped snowing though, so we're pretty thankful for that. We're gonna come around the corner. And luckily this is actually where I work here at the zoo. And I've got some amazing neighbors who live just beside us. So this is what we call goat world. And this is where we keep um, our domestic goat herd. So we're gonna see if they wanna come over and say hi and we'll be able to introduce everyone to them. And then we'll take some questions as well. So in here, we've got a few of our little friends. We'll see, it usually takes them a moment and then they come over and say hi. We do have Daphne, she's just hiding in her shelter there right now. So don't worry, everyone always gets worried that they're out here in the cold all the time. They're not, they have uh, shelters they can go into and they're actually heated. So they have a nice cozy place, warmer than I am right now for sure. Um, in front of us here, we have Easter Bunny, who's just at the top there. We also have Moonshine and Romeo. 
we have Niles and we have Molly Bean as well. So we have a few different goats in here and as they kind of come up, I can introduce you to them and we can hopefully get a nice close up view of them as well. But with that, Jesse, I'm gonna pass it back to you so we can start our questions. Amazing. First of all, I can't believe that that's a goat. I thought that was so chunky, it had to be a pony. So there you go. <laughs> You're assuming that goats can actually get that big. Um, Mary Ellen, yeah, we're going to dive in with questions. YouTubers, Facebook crew, please do share in the chat. I'm going to take one from you immediately just to highlight for the rest of you shy folks that you can absolutely share questions there and I'll take them. And then I'm going to head to Ms. Barajas' class in Oxnard in just a minute to kick us off. Live classes, I'm coming to absolutely all of you. But John wanted to know on Facebook, uh, is there something that you use specifically to help preserve the pelts? You've got these beautiful, beautiful furs there. Is there a chemical? Is there something that you need to do to make sure that they're usable for so long? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. So you're right. They are in really good shape. Um, and there is a lot of work that goes in kind of behind the scenes to get them into that shape. So if anyone is local in this area, or even if you do live further away, it's still an option for you. If you're interested in becoming a vet and you go to school at Guelph University, uh, they actually get a lot of our animals who have passed away and they help us with our uh, animal autopsies or our necropsies on them. And they can also help us with the preserving. Now, some of our bigger animals who pass away, uh, it does take a little bit of a larger uh, job for it. And so the animal is, um, you know, the, we're, we do keep the animal until we're ready to preserve them in that way. Um, and they're often sent off to people who uh, uh, do it as their full-time job. So it's often chemically preserved um, or like tanned, uh, just like if you um, have a like sheepskin blanket or something like that. Uh, it's a very similar process to that. Very cool. Thank you, Mary Ellen. All right, we're going to go to the wonderfully named school, Laguna Vista in California. I'm Ms. Barajas' class. If you guys want to come on up, you are good to go. Hey, guys. You go first. Oh. Hmm. Uh, uh, Peyton wanted to ask, how long do goats live? Ooh. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. How long can they live? So goats, there's a few different types of them um, and, and uh, ones that are out there, but typically they can um, live like into their teens. Um, and again, here at the zoo, Jesse and I, we've talked a lot about this. Oh, hi, Niles. He's coming over to give us a hello kiss here. Um, we've talked a lot about this here, but luckily at the zoo, uh, they do have the extra care that they need. Now, goats like this are not really ones that you'd find necessarily out in the wild. They are more of a domesticated type of goat. Um, but other animals here, luckily they have access to animal health care with our vets and our nutrition team and their keepers coming through to take care of all of them and watch out for any signs of injury. If Bunny actually chooses to come over and say hello to us at any point, you're going to notice very quickly uh, that Bunny's a little bit different than our other goats, and that's because they only have three legs. So Niles here has all four. It's hard to see the fourth one there, but it, it's there in the back. Uh, Bunny only has three, and that's because, unfortunately, uh, there was an injury that happened with their back leg I can't remember exactly which one now left or right and the most humane thing to do in the end was to actually amputate the leg and so unfortunately we did have to do surgery and take the leg away but it doesn't slow bunny down the bunny goes on all sorts of adventures all around the zoo walks off leash uh with the halter on and the only thing that we've had to change is we have these stumps over here I might head over there in a little bit that the goats all get up onto every morning. It's like their pedestals that they stand on and that's where they get their food for the morning and they do some training up there. Uh, you can't see bunnies right now because it's actually on the ground. So it's covered in snow, but bunny gets a stump on the ground instead of a stump up high. Uh, if you ever want to do a program where we're just walking with the goat, we call it Bunny Unleashed. I'm in a thousand percent. <laughs> okay, just let's make that happen. Um, oh, that'd be amazing. Our Mighty Bee Academy, uh, Miss Kim's class. If you guys want to share on behalf of your many kids joining across the U.S., you are in the broadcast. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, Madden would like to know, uh, what is your favorite bio, bio fact? And Vito is asking if the animals get sick sometimes. Ooh, okay. What's my favorite bio fact? That's a great question. I don't know if I've ever been asked that one before. Um, we have a hippo skull. Now, unfortunately, I can't bring it out ever for videos and it does stay under lock and key because of the uh, sensitivity of it and the specialty of it but we had a hippo named Samson pass away several years ago and his skull just his head is um, I would say bigger than Niles body 
Uh, it's absolutely massive. It's almost too big that it's comical to do anything with it. So we have to be really careful with it, but that is the probably my favorite one that we have. Um, and does animals ever get sick? They definitely do. So it happens even through all the care that we have here. Um, they can definitely get sick. We have Niles here who's coughing a little bit for us. I think he just ate some hay. And also he just got um, head butted by his little friend here as well. So he might be having a moment there where he got slightly winded. Um, but yeah, animals can get sick. And it's through the observation that our keepers give with them and then our vet team that works so closely with them that they're able to uh, get better again. So sometimes they can be on antibiotics. Um, I believe one of our goats even is on some arthritis medicine right now as well. Just in the colder months, they find a harder time kind of moving around um, and that can sort of uh, get them to be a little bit slower. Yeah. Great answer, Mary Ellen. We've actually done a whole healthcare program with the Toronto Zoo in the past. If you want to check that out, it is on our YouTube channel. And while you were talking, I brought up a picture of a hippo skull so you can see how absolutely insane these things are. They're like, yeah. like ridiculous. Look at that thing. It's scarier than any dinosaur ever by a big margin. 100%. Uh, great question, guys. All right, we're going to head to our Westview School folks joining us in Alberta. Welcome in and take us away. Hello. How do um how do we learn how extinct animals behave? Oh, how do we learn how extinct animals behave? That's a fantastic question. So I'm gonna be honest, some of it is a little bit of a guessing game, but that's kind of what makes it all really interesting. So I like to say here at the zoo that I know a lot about the animals that we have at the zoo. But if you ask me a question about an animal we don't have here, I can probably figure out the answer based on what I know they're related to. So if we find out about an extinct animal, the way that we'd find out would probably be from their skull maybe. And then we can use those facts and kind of the, what we call rules of thumb for looking at their skull to tell if they were a predator or a prey. So if we find a skull and we see eyes are on front and they have sharp teeth, we can probably make a good conclusion that that animal used to hunt other animals to survive. But if we find them and they have maybe uh, some flat back teeth, maybe they also like to eat hay or grasses. And maybe we find them near the water. So then we might think that that animal maybe liked to be in the water. Or if we find them up at a mountain, maybe they were an animal who liked to climb and be uh, more in the uh, higher altitudes. So we can tell things from their body that gives us kind of behavioral elements of what they used to like to do. That's a fantastic answer. What came to mind for me really quickly while you were asking that is like, so dinosaurs, for instance, we can find footprint tracks of big sauropods and we can see that there's many that walk together. So you can find out that they lived in herds as opposed to one off just from those fossilized footprints, which is really cool. So it's tricky, but as Mary Ellen said, there's lots of little clues that you can use to find out. We have never had that question in 3000 broadcasts exploring by the seat of your pants. So way to go, man. Um, Cochrane, Ontario, Mr. Savage class, come on in. And then we're going to do a whole other round. YouTubers, again, don't be shy. We'd love to take some from you as well, but come on in and Cochrane. Hey, four fives. All right, Andy has a question. Um, what kind of species you want? The egg that you penguin egg that you guys had yeah. oh what kind of species so that was from a um african penguin so that's the type of penguin that we he have here at the zoo and it's kind of comical because uh they're they're the, like pretty much the smallest ones they're they're only about yay big so they're they're pretty small I would encourage our audience, uh, but a lot of people don't even know that Africa has penguins. We've done a lot of programs with a huge rescue hospital in South Africa with penguins. If you want to check them out live, uh, that's all on our YouTube channel. And they're a really, really cool animal. So that was very cool. Thank you for that, guy. All right. A quick one from YouTube. And then I'm going back to Miss Barajas. Uh, let's see. Miss Evans joining us in Oregon wants to know a favorite animal to study or share about. I know we talked about our hippo skull earlier, Ooh. but is there a favorite creature at the zoo you might have, Mary Ellen? There sure is. So we've also done a few videos on them here. I'm going to give this guy a little pat here for being such a good sport. He's got a big itch. That's what he was just doing also with that ball. You can tell that he's very itchy right now. So we're going to try and help him out. Um, I personally absolutely adore the camels, uh, specifically the Bactrian camels. I've done a few videos on them. 
I think they are one of the coolest animals out there. Now we have domesticated Bactrian camels um, and they're doing okay in the wild, but the uh, wild version or so they're doing okay in the world, but the wild version of Bactrian camels are not doing so well, unfortunately. But the reason I like them so much is they're a species that can survive pretty much all weather. They can go negative 40 degrees to positive 40 degrees and they have some incredible adaptations uh, that they're able to use to help them survive, which is amazing. So they're my personal favorite. And if you've ever seen our videos or been to the zoo, you might know we have one and her tongue is out from a previous injury she had when she was a baby. Uh, her name is Tilly and she will forever be number one in my heart. We love the camels and I'm glad we get that question almost every time with you as we get to talk about Tilly. By the way, this is the best goat scratching we've ever had on the broadcast <laughs> in our history as well. Um, let's head back to Ms. Brahas class. Come on back in and take us away, guys. Hey. Uh. How long have you worked there? Oh, good question. Yeah, so I've been here for nine years in total, but I've only been a full-time employee since 2019. So when I first started here at the zoo, I was actually a zoo camp counselor, um, and I have uh, worked my way from a zoo camp counselor to a full-time coordinator here in our learning and engagement department. So it's a very cool journey, and I've, I've loved every moment of it. It's always uh, beyond a pleasure to have you, so I'm glad we got that question. Thanks, guys. Um, Westview School, I'll bring you in next. Miss Kim, if you have another one, please do share, and I'll take our Bayside crew on YouTube as well in just a second. But Alberta, come on back in. Um, how many types of predators are there in the world? Oh, Ooh. how many types are there in the world? Holy smokes. That's a big question. So I don't know if I have an answer off the top of my head for that, but I'll give you some facts and we can maybe estimate it together. So it. <laughs> not every animal could be, or I guess technically in every way, every animal is a predator because everyone's eating something. So these guys are eating hay, but they're still kind of eating it, you know? Um, but think of like lions, tigers, bears, oh my, all of those big ones, but not just the general name for them, but even in grizzly bear or in bears, you have grizzly bear, polar bear, black bears. And then in tigers, you have Sumatrans, Amurs, all different types. There's white lions, uh, tawny lions. So there's all sorts of different subspecies within them as well. I don't know if I could put an actual number on the exact amount that we have in the world. Jesse, do you want to take a, a bet at it? You know what? It's funny because I had an answer in my head based on a fact, and then I'm looking it up as we're going, and it's radically different than my <laughs> thoughts. So the jury's out on this. You stumped the experts here. Mm -hmm. I will say that in, in any habitat, it tends to be that there's about 10% as many carnivores yeah. because if everything was a carnivore, they'd eat each other all the time and it wouldn't really work out. So you need a lot of herbivores. Work. So there's like millions of wildebeest in East Africa and there's a few lions and there's a few leopards and things that eat wildebeest, but there can't be a million of the predators. So there's fewer number, number of species is a harder thing. That's a very tricky question. I love that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, Miss Kim, uh, I'm going to come to you and then I'll take our group from uh, Miss Ivel's class, Bayside, in a second. Hey, welcome back. Yeah, Shaden would like to know uh, what snakes do you have at the zoo or any biofacts on snakes? And Ooh. Addison would like to know how long can hippos live? Ooh, uh, great question. Yeah, so the biofacts that we have for snakes, we do have quite a few snake sheds. So they're really easy for us to come across. And then um, we do have a couple like rattlesnake tails and a few full snake skins. So not as many biofacts from them. And we do have a couple of those eggs, but unfortunately they do get so shriveled up that we do have to um, dispose of them after a while. For snakes at the zoo though, we have reticulated pythons, which are the longest type of snake in the world. We have the massasauga. I think that's Jesse's favorite there. They're pretty cool, I will say. They are massive snakes. Um, you, don't want, you wouldn't want to maybe come across one in the wild. I, I could steer clear of them, but I do respect them as an animal. They're very cool. Um, we have Massasauga rattlesnakes, which is actually a snake that is uh, endangered here in uh, Ontario. And so it's our only rattlesnake uh, snake. And we're actually part of a breeding program, which is really cool for them. Uh, so we do breed them here and they are released. 
which is amazing. And then we have my personal favorite, the red-tailed green rat snake, which if you have not ever heard of that snake, please look them up. I love it because their name is just so descriptive. It gives you every bit of information you need about that snake. What are they? They're a snake. What do they look like? Well, they're green with a red tail. What do they eat? Rats. Um, I think every animal should be named as coherently as they are. Um, Challenge but, accepted. <laughs> right? It's just a fantastic way to name an animal. I love it. And they're a pretty snake too. They're very, very long um, and kind of a slender snake. They're really pretty though. Um, and then uh, we have uh, some emerald tree boas. We have all sorts of different types of snakes. And then I believe the second question was how long can a hippo uh, yes. last? So they are able to live into ours are Samson was in his thirties or forties, I believe when he passed away. Yeah. 40 to 50 is what I brought up on Google very quickly. Yeah. as We were talking about this as the life expectancy. So great question guys. All right, we're gonna do a rapid fire. Final two questions together. It was time flies and you're having fun and we are nearing the end of the broadcast. Um, I'm gonna take one for our Bayside crew, grade threes. Uh, Braden wants to know, how do you get all the animals at the zoo? Are they bred there? Are they rescued? What's the deal? And then we're Oh yeah, good question. Yeah. I'm mm -hmm. also gonna turn our camera back around here. Our goat friends have decided to go into their warm barn here for us. Um, but as I'm doing that, I can answer it here for us. So we get animals in a few different ways. You kind of touched on the two points. Uh, some of them are born here, which is really cool. Um, so they are able to be born here and then we raise them up and sometimes they go to other zoos as well. Oftentimes though, we, because we are accredited facility, we have different relationships with zoos all over the world who are also part of that accreditation and their own accreditations as well. And we work together. Uh, oh my goodness, just as I turned the camera on me, Easter Bunny's decided to come. So let me turn ourselves back around here. Um, so they are part of what I call a dating service for animals. So in order to help all of our species that are endangered, we sometimes will move animals between different zoos uh, to match make them with another animal of their species so that they're able to have the next generation. So there's Bunny as well. You can see we got two front legs and one back leg. Fantastic. Hello, Bunny. Uh, Bunny Unleashed. We're going to make it happen some month. Um, <laughs> Let's head to Mr. Sellers class. Talk around to one more question to wrap us up. A big thank you to all of you. And stick around because we'll do a big thank you and goodbye in a minute. But Cochran, you're up for the last question. Hi, guys. Do you have grizzly bears? Ooh. We do. We do have grizzly bears. So we have Shente. She's our only grizzly bear right now. And she's actually gone down for her winter sleep. So her exhibit's actually boarded up. You can't see her right now. And she's going to have very little activity or movement for the next several months. We're not going to really see or hear from her till springtime. So she's already down for her winter nap. Mary Ellen, this has been an absolute riot. We've had some amazing goat friends. We've got some wicked bio facts. Um, again, if classes, if you want to share this with your friend, family or friends, if you want to tune in for others, they're all on our YouTube channel. Again, this is part of our amazing series with the Toronto Zoo. Check out torontozoo.com. Go visit if you can. If you're in the neck of the woods, it's one of my favorite places. It's basically where I grew up in my spare time. And I have to cross like all of Toronto, which let me tell you is quite a commute from Etobicoke to Scarborough. Um, so Mary Ellen, this has been so, so much fun. Uh, next, We'll see you in February, March. Um, and I'm going to bring in all our classes to say a big thank you and farewell. Cool. Perfect. All right. All right. Take care, everyone. Miss Kim, Wesley School. Bye. 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 Bye.